Hey visionaries, Chris right here with Royal Realty Group, brokered by eXp Realty. Buying and selling a home can be a stressful process, but we are here to help you throughout the way. Feel free to reach out to us on all social media platforms at Royal Realty Group TX. Now enjoy the show with Cuff and Mo. All right, Stu. All right, man. Close your eyes. All right. All right, I want you to envision yourself as the most elite version of yourself. What are you wearing? What do your shoes look like? What type of pants do you have on? What's your body look like? What's your mindset? What are the people that are surrounding you? What do they look like? What type of meetings are you involved with? How do you operate on a day-to-day basis? Do you have that picture in your head? Yes, sir. All right, I want you to look up. Now, are you that elite version of yourself right now? Every day, working closer to it. You know, when I first had that experience where, where I went through that, that practice, um, I, I am that person now. I wasn't when I originally do it, but now when I, I do this, I just think of the, the levels of getting uh, stronger, not necessarily better clothes or, or bigger muscles. It's just how can I get stronger, better, impact more people. So um, I'm, I'm that person physically, but I don't think we'll ever really be that person mentally because we should always be chasing greatness. It's not like, you know, Michael Jordan or Tom Brady is like, I want a championship. I'm good. They're like, how many of these can I can I get? So uh, for me, those rings are helping families, employees. You know, I was telling my wife earlier, I was supposed to do some stuff at the kid's school. And it's like, man, it's a conflict of schedule. I'm not going to be able to do it. She said, well, you know, you got to you gotta learn to put our family first. I said, I, I get it. But you got one family to worry about. I got like 123 families that I'm responsible for. So I have to put those 123 oftentimes before ours. It sucks. You know, yeah. and I don't expect you to get it. But as a leader, that's what I have to do. You know? and, and that's the thing I love about what you're talking about, right? It's the impact. So I, I personally wanted to say thank you because, you know, there's a butterfly effect that exists, right? And you've got... Awesome content. We've been chopping it up since July, January 24th, 2021. So almost two years. You know what I mean? You don't know the impact uh, that you're having on people's lives that you've never even met before. You know, we started this journey, like I said, January 24th, which is a, a cool date, uh, 2021, right? Started emailing you or texting you through uh, LinkedIn. We had a, a guest on our episode, on our podcast, Trevor Young. Shout out to, yeah, shout to Trevor, Trevor. Trevor Young, episode 38. So, visionaries, make sure you guys, you know, go back in the, into the archives and check that one out. But, you know, y- your impact is, is so profound. I just wanted to say thank you, bro. You know, um, we talk about this and we talked about this for a minute. Um, I've, I've wanted you on the show for a very, very long time. So we're honored to have you uh, in the lab as we take the lab on the road. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, end up at Apex headquarters, man. So. I like the way you got that. You call your people visionaries. Yeah. You call it, I like that. You got, I, I dig it. Yeah, you for know. sure. I dig it. Welcome back to the Vision Lab podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Cuffey, alongside with my co-host, Mr. Ryan Mosley. The Vision Lab is the official growth mindset podcast for all visionaries worldwide. We're showing le- mad love to the cigar community. It's here in the lab where we uncover people's visions and dreams and how those dreams actually come into reality. Folks, it's all about tapping into the best versions of ourselves through self-discovery, self-examination, and self-actualization. Mo, you know I'm amped up, anchored down, You've ready to go. You've been amped up for the I'm, past two days. I'm jittery, bro. Like, this is a dream come true. Who do we have on the show today? Cuff, today's guest uh, is a native Texan. He is an author, a motivational speaker, and uh, we are sitting in his uh, his office today. He is the owner of Apex. Please welcome Ryan Stewart to the Vision Lab Podcast. What up, what up, what up, yo. You know, this might be 
the, this will definitely be the last podcast that I'm ever a guest on in this room. Right? I might shoot one more of my own next week, but we move out of here next week, so you guys are officially the last podcast that I will be a guest of in this building. This is an end of a five-year era in this tower. Let's here. make it a good one. Hey, and, and this is the only time you'll probably ever do an interview with all Ryans. Never done that before, <laughs> ever, ever. So, so do you know what the name means, Ryan? Little King, right? Yeah, yes. absolutely. So since we're talking about names... Um, who is Ryan Keith? Well, you know, that's funny you say that because, and I don't know for for, for anything, I was born uh, Ryan Russell McCord. I was adopted, and I became Ryan Keith Stuman. But but the guy who adopted me was adopted too, mm-hmm. right? And then I, I'm, I don't know the full story because, you know, you get lost in history, right? When you lose your whoever your parents are, things get lost. But we didn't have Facebook back then to track everything down, right? So... I'm pretty sure that guy, my grandfather, was adopted as well. So that wow. means that means fake name to fake name to fake name to, to me fake name. I adopted a kid, so he's got a fake name too. He five three, four maybe five generations deep of this this name. And if you look up the name Stuman on social media, there's not very many. There's like my sister's married now, so she's she's not that. My mom and my stepdad and maybe two or three other people. Know, that aren't my wife and kids. Right? right. They're not on Facebook. So so what I'm saying is it's not a very popular name, but but it means according to my stepdad. Now the reason why I preface <laughs> this long ass story with this name is my stepdad, I mean we don't have Google and shit back then. So the, the word passed down was Stuman in German has something to do with King of the Pond. Okay. Right? So it was weird that that my name was Little King and then I got adopted to be King of the Pond. So about three or now about five years ago, my pastor who's been a good friend of mine for nineteen years now, twenty years now, uh, we have a little praying session and he you know, he puts his hands on me, blah blah blah, and he says, Let me tell you, you're a king, you're a king maker, you turn people into kings, that's what you do, and he's just praying over me. And I'm thinking, you know, uh it's crazy that that names get repeated and then somebody gives you like a moniker like a hardcore closer or a king maker or whatever yeah. the case so this some sort of i haven't i don't have a kingdom or a crown brother but uh at some point that's got to be a part of my call and it's too frequent you well know? It's, it's you know we're talking <laughs> about names right and i think it's important that that you know who you are right um your pastor spoke powerful words over you and i know and i want to get into the impact on on words and how they can actually you know, transform and change your life, right? But you know, my middle name is Lance, which which and um, means land, right? So little king of land. Of the land, yeah. Yeah. So I got a pond, you got land. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> and then so uh, apex, that's the top, that's the pinnacle. Where, let's talk about the name apex. Well, uh, how did you get there? What was the thought process behind that? So this is business, right? And then this will be a great lesson for people that are trying to build a brand. You know, my in the sales world, that's how I started out was I was just teaching people sales because that's all I knew, right? I'm not going to teach you something that I don't know, right? That's not the mark of a good teacher. So when I started online, you know, people in the car business, in the mortgage world called me the hardcore closer because I'd been to prison, but I was always top producer and a little rough around the edges in case you can't tell. And so it was just kind of a nickname that stuck. One day I registered it on the internet, you know, as a domain. This is a long, long time ago, 14 years ago. Registered on the internet as a domain, just kind of like parked it to the side and used it for some videos or whatever the case may be. But as I started training loan officers, you know, people would become successful with my program. But then occasionally, like once a month, somebody, and remember, I didn't have a whole lot of clients in the beginning, but somebody would say, hey, man, can you take my testimonial off your website? Because one of my clients Googled me, and I showed up on some hardcore sales website. You know, <laughs> it's not a good look. So I realized, oh, man, it's a funny brand, and it's cool, and it stands out, but this isn't going to serve the professionals I'm trying to serve, right? Right. So we, we transferred it over to Break Free Academy, right? That became the, the which is, the, you see the logos here, and that became the company. That's still the company that we all work for that's their shirts that they have on there um and we were selling digital products and everybody kept saying hey you should start a mastermind you know you should have this mastermind and we did that and we just called the break free academy tribe and you know really didn't think nothing of it uh, because i was more interested in selling the digital products but at some point i became the center of the show it's like hey this is ryan steumann's mastermind this is ryan steumann's digital products and i realized that 
if I'm ever going to get out of this business, and I'm not saying that I want to, but I would like to have the option, right? That's what we do as business owners. So if I'm ever going to escape from this business and have the option, it can't be built around Ryan Stuman. I've got to, I've got to be able to position other leaders. Because here's the thing about owning a business. If you're the only person that can do that job, that's a dead-end job for you for the rest At of your career. At some point, you'll crash out. That's it. That's it. And so I needed to be able to lift up other leaders. Well, I couldn't do that under brands that I created. So once again, this was 2018 when we did this. I created the Apex brand, right, and made it, you know, it's not about me. It's I'm a part of it. I'm a member. I don't even take money from it. The whole thing either goes to charity or giving back to the organization. <clears throat> I make my money from speaking books, you know, investments, that kind of stuff. And so I'm actually just a member like everybody else, but I pay the biggest bill because if y'all don't pay y'all's bill, I got to pay the <laughs> bill regardless for the hotels or whatever, <laughs> right? So um, which is my responsibility as the leader. And so Apex, I wanted it to be, and it is something that somebody can put this on, and you may not know who I am, right? And you may not even give a shit who Ryan Suman is. You're just proud to be a part of Apex. You're proud to be a part of that network. Adam Lyons might have brought you in there. Jessica Denny might have brought you in there. Drewby Wilson might have brought you in there. You don't even know who the hell I am. And, and, and I like that. I was in the elevator going to an event uh, six or so months ago. And I was me and my assistant were in the elevator. And there was another... Uh, lady and another gentleman in the elevator. They're wearing our shirts, so clearly they were going to our event, right? Right, no and idea. My assistant introduced herself, and she and the lady goes, well, what do you do for a living? She goes, well, I work for Ryan Stuman. And the lady's like, who's that? He sounds cool. It's <laughs> like, oh, that's great. I didn't even say nothing. I just like, don't say shit. Like, let's just, you know, <laughs> let's just enjoy this moment for me, because that's a real brand. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you've got guys like Tony Robbins, who's a big hero, but – uh, him and Zig Ziglar are good good examples. Tony's tried to step away a couple times, but if his name's not attached to it and he's not in it, people won't buy it because they want Tony. You yeah. know? Same when Zig passed away. Um, when Jim Rome passed away, they'll buy their books and stuff. But, you know, if Tom Ziglar starts a mastermind today, it's not his dad. It's not the same. And I didn't want to put that burden on my kids because I've watched – leaders that I respect and still have a lot of admiration for that I learned from their mistakes too. So I wanted to build something that if I die today, you're one of the leaders in the crew. You step up and, and you took well take off where I stopped, you know, as opposed to the whole movement dying and everybody just being depressed because it's over with. Yeah. Was it hard to navigate that? Like are you at some point you realize like, okay, yes, this is, you know, you're at the core of it, but like you just said, you had the foresight to be like, okay, but this still has to be bigger than me. Like I it's cool for me to be like of it, and but I got to be in the background because this Apex brand has to stand on its own. It's like, how did you navigate that? Because at some point, it's still your baby, but you got to get to where it can walk on its own. The biggest thing that I had to do, uh, the hardest thing that I've had to do for this whole process is really drop my own ego. Mm. Um, let's say that you're, I, I've done 3,000 podcasts, you know, I've recorded almost 10,000 videos. I've been at this for a long time and done a lot of it. And... I can't expect someone else to be as good as me. So I, I have to, and they will eventually, you know what I mean? But they, I'm, I've been doing the work a lot longer. You know what I mean? Like if someone just starts to get into the gym today, they gonna have a long time before they can catch up to me. You know what I mean? That's just how it works. And so, but I've had to, to lower my ego and be able to share that stage with people. You know, I've got guys like Brandon Brittingham, who is a, uh, uh, he does about $400 million a year in real estate transactions in the state of Maryland. You know, he's the face of our investor program, Apex Investors. So it's like, I don't have anything to do with that. I rented out Globe Life Field over here, the brand new Ranger Stadium, yeah. and threw an event there and didn't even go to the damn event because he ran the whole thing. I was in Atlanta that weekend. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, but but I had to find those people. Now, I've, I put a lot of people in, in the stages that didn't belong there. And what happens to a lot of people, and this is, this is the hard part, is let's say, Mo, I put you up on the stage six months people feeling you getting likes on social media you forgot that i'm the one that put you on you start thinking it's all about you and you don't need this apex and you know everybody's on your train like you're hot now and then you leave and it's a cold winter right and then i'm the bad guy because you hate me because you let your ego come in between us so i've had people do that several times where i tried to make them one of the people one of the leaders in the program and they let it go to mm. their head and and that's hard because you know I've lifted someone up and said good things about them only to watch them fall apart in front of the community, which is hard. And it makes it makes me feel like maybe I shouldn't have judged the person. Right. So I've had to go through a lot of that to get the handful of leaders that I have today in there. But there's a lot of people who they show up at these events that like they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know who that guy was. He's a pretty good speaker. You ever heard of him <laughs> talking about me because they came there for some of these other leaders, a lot of 
influencers with blue checks that are business influencers, not the, you know, the workout people. And we have yeah. those two, but people that actually own businesses, you know, and that's the hardest way to get a blue check on social media. Someone that has a, a podcast, a business, something like that is just the hardest way because we're not celebrities. You know what I mean? Celebrities, are hot chicks and bikinis, yeah, fit yeah. dudes that play sports, you know, actors like it's the real, it's the real work though. It is. It's it the is. real, the hardest like my philosophy is like putting your hands in the dirt, like really like let, yep. let's, let's get in the mud and like scrap it out. And so that's where the real work is. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and when, so <clears throat> some of the people we have, like Adam Lyons that has that, that's somebody who's just contributed a massive amount of content and business to the world so much that they've said, all right, we're going to give it to them. So it, it is something that those are the kind of people we have leading this program. And I had to I had to give up my need for attention and my needs. Like right now, Drewby's downstairs with about 55 people uh, teaching them my program, right? So he's down there, and they don't know for shit, like – it, the, he invented it, I invented it, but he's teaching everything that I invented step by step, word for word, as if it's his own stuff, because that's what we're doing. Yeah. And for a lot of people, they couldn't be like that. You know, oh, you can't sing my music when you go out there. You got to sing your own ships. Like, I need you to sing my, my music to get this thing rolling right. So that's been the hardest part. But now that I've got the right people in place, which took a few years, but now that I've got the right people in place, it's a well oiled machine. And, uh, it's nice because we can throw a two-day event that literally I'm only committed to 45 minutes a day. Go down there, speak, roll back out, got a whole team to run it. That's dope. That's dope. Um, I, I want to go back because I, I want people to really know your story, right? Um, hardcore closer. Um, let, let's go all the way back to the 80s, okay? SNLs, um, they go down, and, and you guys are, are really left with nothing. And what happens, what happens then? You know, I uh, – it's a blessing and a curse. Honestly, I have a great memory. Uh, I can almost remember everything back to like two years old, what I got for Christmas and all this stuff. And, and uh, it's one of the things my pastor is always saying. It's like, man, you remember stuff that I said that I don't remember. I said, it's like, <laughs> man, you know, it's just how I am. I'm really good at retaining information. And, uh, and I say it's a curse because I know a lot too. So a lot of stuff doesn't slip by me, which, you know, you get to pick and choose what you say and stuff. So, um, but that being said, you know, when I was young, five, six years old, I remember, you know, getting hundred dollar bills for Christmas inside of Christmas cards, which was a lot of money back then, a whole lot of money. It's a, it's a lot of money to get for Christmas now. Yeah. You know, a tank of gas, but I mean, back then in the eighties, that was a lot of money. I remember wearing, you know, nice clothes. My mom always having a brand new car. Then about six years old, about eighty six, eighty seven, the savings and loans crashed across the country. And so we've seen this happen a few times, and we'll probably watch it happen again. But I uh, think the subprime crash in 2008 when all the banks, you know, went out of business, the same thing happened, but it was little credit unions, we'll call them. That's the equivalent of a savings and loan. Right. My grandfather owned about four of these credit unions in small towns, right, these savings and loans. And they finance farms and cattle and lines of credit for feed and things of that nature. And uh, when the SNLs go under, they start pulling lines of credits from these bank, and now all of a sudden you don't have any money to lend out. You got to call your notes due on yep. your people because you owe. That's exactly what happened. There was an asshole named John McCain that was the guy that was the uh, the dude that was behind all this. A lot of people don't know this, but he was behind a lot of this. He he was in charge of the Resolution Trust Company, which was scooping these things up out of bankruptcy left and right. Okay, sharking them, sharking them exactly. He set them up to fall, then sharked them out. Right. Grandfather, most people don't know that, but since it was the family business, I heard about it all the time, right? <laughs> so um, that devastated my family. First of all, my mom and dad were married. Grandpa on my mom's side owns the banks. Grandpa on my dad's side owns a bunch of businesses. Banks go under. Businesses are tied to the bank. Divorce happens. Family hates each other. You know, one family moves. It's just this this whole thing that was out of control. It's you know, a my recipe for disaster. My grandma... Uh, tried to lie to the feds when they were going and auditing the books and gave money to the farmers anyway. And she ended up doing six months in federal prison. So, you know, we're getting run out of town because everybody thinks we stole their money because there wasn't no Google in the media. So if CNN wasn't talking about it on TV, you didn't have no computer to go to and go, what do you mean the savings and loans are crashing? You didn't know. you just in a town of 800 people. And now all of a sudden the banker who's seemingly rich telling you, you ain't got no money in this bank. Right. <laughs> right. That's exactly what's going on. We talking about real life lynch mobs and everything. These farmers coming out with pitchforks and shit. Mad at my family. Drove both my families out of town. We moved to Dallas from the small town that we were in and uh anyway 
you know, I, mom and dad split. A couple years later, my mom remarries. I get adopted. We, our dumbasses moved back to this small town again, thinking the smoke settled. You know what I mean? <laughs> but all the kids, I got a different name now. And this is probably the hardest, as an adult now thinking back, probably the, the hardest part of my life, but I'm thankful for it because things that you go through hard make you better, stronger. You know? Yeah. But these kids telling me, you know, your dad left you. You screwed our families up. You know, the whole town hates you. You don't even have a name anymore. You know, what you I got mean? a scarlet like, dollar yeah, sign yeah, on your head. Exactly, exactly. And you're like, look, bro, I'm just 11 years I'm like, old. Fuck, I'm eight. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't like the, I like the name McCord. I didn't even choose to be a student. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like in the world of names, I was cool with the one that seems normal, not the one that means king of the pond, right? So, like, you know, like as a kid, you know, and, and then so we, my, my parents move out of town again. I did like first, third grade there, moved out of, back to Dallas or to this suburb of Dallas called Allen. And man, you know, I just didn't fit in in that small town. Uh, the, it, really, Allen was like 15,000 people. So it was kind of small, but it was kind of a mid, mid tier of Dallas at the time. You know what I mean? Not too big, not too small. Uh, but it's mostly like, I didn't know this till now, but growing up was mostly Mormons there. Mm. And as a kid, you don't know that. You're like, you know, just everybody's cool till they different than you. And, you you know, and, and when you're kids, everybody gets along pretty good. But in high school, things were different. I like to party. Mormons don't like to party. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and the principal's Mormon and everything else. And a kid, I don't even know what a Mormon was at the time. I'm just like, you know. These Latter-day Saint churches are all over the place in the city. You know what I mean? Like, I wonder who goes there. You know, we're Methodists. Or whatever, right? like, I don't know. And, and don't have anything against them. I'm just some of the hardest working, greatest people I know out of Salt Lake. You know what I mean? Best salesmen I know are, are Mormons. But I didn't know that as a kid. They're, the way they live is different. So here I am smoking cigarettes, growing my hair out with earrings. And, you know, Mormons, they look like people with good haircuts, don't smoke cigarettes, don't do nothing but go to church and can goods or whatever, right? It's like... I was just hell on that school. So at age 15, I left school and just went to work and uh, was kicked out of school. But, but, and then just like started working at the car wash. Yeah. Didn't pay me enough money, sold drugs. $3.85. $3.85 an hour is what I started at. You're sure right. That was, that was minimum wage. And I think, I think that was 87 or 88 about that time, 89 maybe. But, um, and then, I started selling drugs. I met a guy at the car wash who uh, always dressed really nice, had really nice cars, always wore like a Rolex and, you know, and a, uh, a diamond ring and stuff. I thought Stu was a lawyer, you know what I mean, maybe an agent for a sports team or something like that. And one day, you know, I watched his car for six or eight months. One day I said, hey, man, what, what, do, you, what do you do for a living? He's like, you smoke weed? And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, who don't smoke weed? You know what I mean? He goes, well, hit me up. Here's my beeper number. Hit me up after yeah. work. I'll give you something like, shit, you're a drug dealer? I didn't know you could make that kind of money selling weed, right? Which clearly you can't. He was selling coke. But but <laughs> weed's a gateway drug, right? Yeah. So so uh, I did that for a couple years, just sold it to adults, but but never sold it to, like, kids my age because I always felt like an old soul. I just now feel like I – they say act your age. I just now feel like I'm I'm the age I should be been at. I feel like I've been 40-something years old for 30 yeah. years now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, and so, you know, dealing with a lot of adults, I got a sense of entrepreneurism selling drugs, even though I ended up getting arrested and doing time for it. I learned how to market something that you can't market. You think about this, like I learned how to cold call people. What's up, Ryan? You need some uh, weed on Friday night? Okay, I'm gonna put something to the side for you. You can't, but you had to learn a different code language. Mm -hmm. Hey man, you gonna need something Friday? All right, how much you gonna need? All right, I got you. Yeah. you like, you had to really learn how to become a good salesman and a good marketer without selling or marketing anything because you never knew who could use whatever the fuck you were going to say against you. And so, anyway, go to jail, come, go to prison, get out of prison after doing two years, went to like seven different prisons, fucking nightmare, get out, go back to work, the car wash, work my ass off. I'm convinced one thing, I ain't ever going to sell drugs or break the law again, and I'm never going to do any, I'm going to become the best car washer on the planet. I'm going to know how to build this damn territory, <laughs> set it on fire, have it built back in two days, right? Let's go. <laughs> and that's what I did. Hard work will go unnoticed, but eventually it can't be ignored. And one of the customers realized that, hey, this dude's working out here. He's selling shit, wiping shit, cleaning shit, waxing shit, like, I'm going to hire this guy. They offered me, she offered me a job. She's uh, passed away now, but mm. uh, she offered me a job in the finance business. I didn't even have a credit card, and I paid 900 bucks cash for the truck I was driving, <laughs> right? Like, I don't even have a bank account. I'm down there at the apartment complex paying in $5 money orders and shit. Um, 
Again, fresh out of prison. You know, and when you leave prison, there's lies they tell you. They say you can't get a passport, you can't vote, you can't get a bank account. All that's not true. That's just shit that people in prison that ain't got out yet that don't know. <laughs> say to people that don't know shit. But like I didn't in the beginning, I didn't know all that, right? So I'm like keeping cash, thinking if I put my felonious money in a fucking bank account, they're gonna take it. That's not the case, right? Yeah. As long as it's not criminal money. So anyway, go through all that. She gives me a job in finance, teaches me the ropes. Within a year, with, literally within 18 months, I've made almost $800,000 working at that job. I went from making $48,000 a year to almost a million dollars in a year. So I did what any 26-year-old with millions of dollars in income coming in and properties and shit from dumb shit. You know? Burn it up. Burn it up. Because in the subprime boom, this it's never going to end. This shit's going to last forever. It's yeah. real estate. You're you know walking I mean? printing press. I was. And... Uh, Problem is, I got attention of the police in that small town. They thought I was selling drugs, man. But, like, in my time, being in a bunch of federal prisons and a bunch of state prisons, I never met drug dealers that were making the kind of money that I was, right? Like, prison's full of poor people. Prison's not full of dudes that were, like, you know, the like big ballers. You know what I mean? Like, they, even, there's a few. There was Rick Ross, you know, the real freeway Ricky Ross. He was in there for a while. There's, a, like, there's the guys from the... Um, um, the 50 Cent Show, Big Meech and them that mm -hmm. are still in there, but that's very few and far. The majority of them are people that got busted mm -hmm. with two, three hundred, two, three thousand dollars worth of shit. Now they're serving 20, 30 fucking years, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and it's sad, right? But that's the majority of people in there. And you think when you watch, or maybe you don't, but maybe people listening, you think, you know, drug dealers make a lot of money and stuff. This, they look like they make a lot of money because they got to carry all their shit in cars and jewelry and stuff because you can't go and buy all these things because the IRS will dig into you. You can't go put that money in a in bank, bank account <laughs> because the fucking IRS will dig into you. So you got to buy that car. You got to. So it's it's just like this false bravado to be real, right? And then the second the cops are on to you, all that shit's theirs anyway. You re up your car, they take it all from you. That's how the cops make money to go get more tanks, to go get more drug dealers so they can bring drugs into the country. Anyway, I'm going through all this. Get out, get my stuff together, make all this money. The cops think I'm selling drugs. I live in a nice house, like two-story, 3,000-square-foot home, swimming pool. But here's my thing. I'm working from home. I figured I've always been a computer guy. I figured out how to hack into the banker server from the Internet at my house so I could just do mortgages from my house, right? Like, I'm still kind of that you, guy. You were working right? from home before yeah, working from home was exactly. a real thing. 2005, I'm working from home. I owned 32 houses at the time. So first of the month... 32 people stopping by, at least 30 stopping by, paying me rent. I got probably 10 real estate agents throughout the month coming by, dropping off contracts, right? Now, these 32 houses weren't all like two, three, four hundred thousand dollar houses, which would be five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar houses. Now, this might be a you know, $30,000 house in East Dallas that somebody's okay. drove to the other side of town to pay me in a money order. So I get it. I'm in this rich neighborhood. And or this higher upper end middle class neighborhood. Yeah, and too I got much, too much traffic. Fast Kia coming over, <laughs> followed by an agent in a Mercedes. Like looking back, I wasn't doing nothing wrong, so I'm not thinking of it. But if I was optics, a cop optics. looking on the outside, you know. Yeah. So they they raided my house. Obviously, didn't have any drugs, but I had a gun. Gun wasn't mine, but I end up taking the damn fall for the damn thing. So I go federal prison 15 months. While I'm in there, my wife leaves me all those houses, everything. I come out with $25 to my name. So it's 2022, 20, almost 2023 with the time we're doing this podcast right now. 2008, I started my life over from scratch. Now, some people say they started from scratch. Like I had to move in with my mama. I went to prison, a millionaire. I moved out. A broke ass dude with fifty dollars to my name that had to borrow a thousand dollars from my grandma and move in with my mama just so I could get new tires on my truck and fill it up with gas so I could go find a fucking job. That's how big of a, a swing my life was. I never forget my stepdad. It was his gun, by the way. My stepdad puts I, he pulls up to the bus station, the train station in Plano over here. When I'm getting out of federal prison, I get in his truck. He's taking me home. He says, this is the last time we're going to make this right. If you end up in trouble again, you ain't going to be welcome back in our house. And I'm thinking, I bought that motherfucker for you. <laughs> That's my house, motherfucker. What yeah. you talking about? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it was your gun. Bitch, I did time for you. <laughs> and you and you at, fucking my mom. And, and, he's at, and he's acting brand new. Hey, everyone. Edwina Brown here, owner-operator of Blowing Smoke Cigar Lounge. We're located at 1604 North Interstate 35E in Lancaster, Texas. We would love for you to come see us. 
We stand on the three C's, which are cigars, our community, and our culture. Cigars, we have over 300 SKUs in our humidor and it's still growing. Come check it out, a massive humidor. We also love our culture here, which we're about customer service, as well as community, which is why we're excited to partner with the Vision Lab podcast. So come check us out. So I, immediately I'm like, I get the fuck out of this house. You know what I mean? Like I can't be around these people. Yeah, it's too much. And I hadn't talked to my family in 12, 13 years anyway. Um, but I mean, you talk about an all time low, swallowing with my pride, not having no damn money. Wife left me, got to go move in with my parents who I can't stand, you know, like embarrass all my friends, friends, you know, them people. They're like, see, man, that dude ain't shit. He was just lucky in the subprime boom. But that was a big fuel for me. 2008, the world's falling apart in mortgages, but my dumb ass went back to work in it because that's all I knew. It was that or wash cars, and I knew one of them didn't pay like the other. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I go back in, and I realize the competition's gone. You see, the 2005, 6, 7 era when I was doing loans, man, you write loans, you write loans, he's writing loans, he's writing loans. Fuck, I'm competing for every agent in the Metroplex's attention, right, against all these bankers. Shit, when the sub when the rates went up and the subprime boom went away, ninety percent of those dudes went out of the way. So now all of a sudden we got a bunch of lonely realtors out there on the hunt, right? Hey man, can I be your banker? So I start calling the people that were leave. Let's say Kenny here leaves the uh, mortgage industry. I call Kenny up. It's like, hey man, what are you gonna do with all the realtors and your book of business and stuff? So oh, man, I'm in insurance now. I don't even care. Well, give it to me, man. Let me take care of them. If something happens, I'll send you a couple hundred bucks or whatever for every deal I close. Man, I scooped up everybody's book. Ended up making three, four hundred thousand dollars in two thousand and nine, in a time where nobody was really making money in the mortgage business in Texas. But two thousand and ten, once again, our government steps in, creates something called the Dodd Frank, Frank. and uh, which had some validation to it. But part of the consequences against my fault, not anybody else. When Obama signed it into law, said if you were a felon in the last seven years, they wouldn't give you any kind of financial license. I'm still on parole at the time. So mm. uh, imagine being the top producer in a company, December, January, February, knowing that March 10 was the day that you could no longer even work there. And everybody just had to like, and to make it bad, make matters worse, I was trying to buy a house in February so that I could close in March. And then the underwriter said, but we know you ain't going to have a job after March 10th, so uh, we can't give you a house. Ooh. So I ended up having to move in with my fucking in-laws because I couldn't get a house. Now now I've lost my job. Again, this is the story of my life. A lot of money, nothing, right? Like 700 grand in a year, prison, right? Three, $400,000 in a year, no job, moving in with in-laws, <laughs> right? You think, well, hey, what the hell happened to that money, right? Well, I bought a house, okay? I rented out the house. I had about probably fifty, sixty thousand dollars saved up. So you think, let's say it was three hundred thousand dollars, a little over that. Forty uh, percent of that goes to taxes, so that puts us down to like I don't know, two ten, two hundred. And then from two hundred thousand dollars, I bought a house out of it. I put twenty percent down, so that was like forty five thousand bucks. I had to buy a car, so that's another. So you know, shit goes through real it life, and, and it's over the course of a year. We're talking, you know, living eight, nine thousand dollars a month when it's all said and done after taxes and everything else. So, but I saved up about fifty grand, and I go and I meet. This is a cool story. I go and I meet this guy Mike Reese for lunch, and I'm gonna ask Mike for a job. He's a real estate agent. Hey man, just let me work the phones. I'll figure some shit out. And uh, Mike's still a friend of mine today. And This is uh, Jake from State Farm, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's dressed like Jake from State Farm. It's Keller Williams Red Day. And uh, he gave me some CDs that were like eight eight thousand dollars or something, he said. And I'm like, man, he's like the cheapest dude I know. So like the fact that somebody sold him these CDs, I'm like, I gotta see what that's about. But it taught me how to do this website shit. And like I said, I'd already hacked into the bank server, so I kinda understood the internet and how that shit worked. And this showed me a whole other side. And I kind of understood how the bank was collecting leads to get them to us as well. But this, like, put all those pieces together. I'm like, oh, shit. It, like, like you said, sometimes you hear the right words or something. It's like that sequence all of a sudden went, man, I can build websites. And so that's what I started doing. And I built a website to sell an energy drink. And I ran ads for the energy drink and ended up making a few sales from it. So I knew it was possible, but I didn't get rich, right? But I wrote this book on how to help loan. And now that I'm not a loan officer, I can like tell you some insider shit as a customer and not get in trouble, right? So I wrote this book on how to help loan officers called, or how to help clients it's called Know What You're Owed is How to Get Taxes Back. Anyway, I sell the first month. I put like two grand in ads in it. Let's say I made 10 grand. I'm like, oh, this is cool. You know, like next month I put eight grand in. Say I made like 15 or so grand. It's like, oh shit, this is actually scaling. I'm making a profit from this thing. 
So, man, after three or four months of doing this, I got a little system put in place. Man, I'm betting twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month on ads on this thing that I built it up to right on Google. And all of a sudden, man, I start getting chargebacks. And the book was like 25 bucks. Chargeback, the fuck? Like a lot. Like a whole lot. Now, remember, if you spent forty grand on ads and people charging you back, that forty grand that you have in the chargeback has already gone in the ads, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm getting these chargebacks and people are saying, the shit that I'm teaching isn't possible anymore. This Dodd Frank Act changed it, and I didn't know that how I am wrote below <laughs> since then. So think about it. That little $25, $25 wouldn't hurt you. Like financially, you know, anybody's not going to lose their life over 25 bucks. So I could have told everybody to kick rocks and, you know, shit, my bad, you know. But my integrity was on the line because if people were asking for money back, hey, I didn't want people to spend money for some shit that they didn't get value from. Uh, but I spent all of our family's money, like everything, drove my whole account to zero to make everybody hold that asked for a, a refund because what happens is you find out that I'm giving refunds and you tell him and you email people in a group and the next thing you know, everybody's Line out front. 25 fucking bucks. Financially ruined me, zero, right? Again. Again, right? So living with the in-laws, figuring this shit out, going to a therapist, trying to convince her I'm not crazy, <laughs> you know, this kind of shit. And... Go through a divorce. You know, I'd gotten remarried and had a kid during this time. Go through my third fucking divorce. And, man, I just think the end of the world is going to happen, right? But I never quit. You know, like, every time some shit happened, I just learned to, like, pivot and be better. You know? But I got I to gotta stop you right here because people need to know what you're talking about. What is this, this force that's coming at you? What well, do you call it? I call it the force of average. And, and life on this planet will reward you if you're average. And what I mean is you can get uh, government, be an average, you can get government assistance, a good job, tax benefits. Like you make 120 grand a year, family, household, combined income. You're going to get the best child credit write-offs. You're going to get the best tax incentives. You can qualify for government health care or corporate health care. When you start making three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 a year, it changes, man. It changes. You get taxed more. There's more people with their hand out trying to take things from you. All of a sudden, the insurance costs more. All of a sudden, this costs more. And you, th and because you're escaping that average, and the more you're chasing greatness, which anything above average is the pursuit of greatness, you're chasing greatness. What happens is average is calling your name. There's an algorithm on this planet that's trying to force us all to be average. Think about it. the government rewards you for being an average citizen, right? The the the. Uh, corporations reward you for being an average employee. The banks reward you for being an average uh, depositor. Like that's the, the average. If you're below average, then the world tries to lift you up. Oh, hey, little buddy, you're below average. Let us help you up and become average. So you can be comfortable like us. But as soon as you start becoming above average, motherfuckers be like, oh, he thinks he's better than us. You know? Oh, shit, man. You know, this dude, it's only a matter of minutes before he crashes. And we watch people go up and down. And up and down, I'm giving you a hell of a story about up and down here. But the truth is, the force of average attacks people with distraction. And so what happens is, you know, uh, my wife leaving me distracted me from my life's purpose. Yes, sir. Right? Uh, getting fired from that, that mortgage job was a blessing, but it distracted me from my life's purpose. Trying to sell a book on mortgages was a distraction from my life's purpose. See, my life purpose is clear. I'm here to help as many people as possible become the greatest version of themselves, right? Now, uh, I'm not going to be able to do that as a banker. So God knows my mission in life. He's revealed this to me. He knows my mission in life. So he's He's trying to put me on this mission. But here I am saying, hey, but I need to write this book on mortgages. No, no, no. I'm going to bankrupt you again, you idiot, <laughs> until yeah. you get where you're supposed to. So 2014, I have, up until this point, I've been pretending, even as this hardcore closer guy, I've been pretending to be this like Jake from State Farm type of person. You know, I talk like Ned Flanders and the videos are still on YouTube. The old videos are still there where I was just I, I was just trying to be this good little banking average, you know, force of average victim, right? In 2014, I just said, you know what? Forget all that. I'm just going to tell the world who I am and they're just going to have to deal with it. I'm tired of hiding it. It's stress. I'm not ashamed of anything I did. Every crime I committed was victimless. Every crime I committed wasn't nobody in bond and rob nobody and steal nobody and even get caught selling drugs to nobody. I got caught all on my own. Nothing I did was some kind of crime of atrocity. I've never hurt anybody. There's nobody that can say I ever shot, stabbed, any of that shit to them. I, I, didn't, I don't do people wrong, so I'm just going to come out. 
And what happened when I came out and just told people the story that I've told you guys, I started to resonate with millions of people because nobody else had that story at the time. They were all hiding it just like me. Now I'm Grant Cardone and everybody used to be a badass. Everybody had a rough childhood. Before me, none of that shit fucking existed, right? Like, I have text messages from him saying, hey, man, you shouldn't tell people that. It's going to end your career. You shouldn't get tattoos. That'll end your career. Now they all look like me, you know, and... And it's cool. I'm flattered. You know what I mean. But it, but it, it took me being the, the person with the, 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 the stones to finally say, hey man, it's not even. The, I wasn't even the brave enough. It's just the frustration enough to finally say, you know what? I'm tired of fucking pretending to be Jake. I'm Ryan. Yeah. You know? How three divorces? Yeah. Money up, money down, money gone. Build it back up. What gives you the gall? What gives you the balls? What gives you that mindset to to say fuck it? I, I got to go back and get or know, know that I can go back and get it. Uh, that's a really good question. I have a really good answer that I think will resonate with, with you and the audiences. You know, I just wanted to be a car wash guy. I was happy being that force of average victim. A car wash guy can make 80, 90 grand. That's average, right? Like he can, I could have done that. Could have been the best car wash guy making above average car wash shit, but an average person regardless, right? And would have been happy, to be honest. But I just wanted to work hard. And then when I made that first lick and, you know, made over the course of two, three years, over a million dollars and then went to prison, everybody kept saying that I was lucky. But but I was the number one fucking dude in the company. I wasn't lucky. You don't become number one for luck. Everybody that's ever been number one at anything knows that ain't luck. You might whoop me in a, your first pool game. But if we going to fucking play back to back for years, you're not you're not going to be the champion your first pool game, you know what I mean? Like yeah. and so for me, I felt like I needed to prove those people wrong. When I got when I went to prison, the federal prison, uh some of them people, I say my friends at the time, but them people, they were saying, you know, ah, he's lying to us, man. He's selling drugs again. Everybody's time. got that's a story. Why, that's why he has these fucking cars and shit. He wasn't doing Morgan. That was a front. We fucking knew this guy was a fucking drug dealer. Once a drug dealer, always a drug dealer. And this is not the fucking case. These are my own people, you know? So when I got out, I had to prove to them that they're just losers who never got it together in the first place. And I could go get it no matter what the fuck they throw against me. So imagine that fuel. Right? Like, I got race cars and I drove a 720S today. It's got a thousand horsepower. You put, you can put 199 octane in that thing, right? And it'll burn it and it'll go fucking fast. And that motherfucker's vicious. And we talking two second, you know, two second to 60s, just like, hey, I don't care. You Tesla owners, fuck off. You're not as fast as car, right? <laughs> and so, but if I'm burning that high octane gas every day and now I'm sitting in traffic with it. Right, and now I'm letting the car run while I'm waiting on my kids with it. And I'm not on the track with it. I'm just driving this bitch 60 to 100 miles an hour, which is average for that car. That 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 octane's gonna start wearing that engine down, right? And so eventually, I'm gonna have to dumb it down to like 93 regular Supreme, you know, what the engine needs. So I say that because that anger, trying to prove all those people wrong, was like that 100 octane for me, right? Mm -hmm. It got me going fast, and it helped me keep determined to show them. But at some point, I'm like. I'd already proved them all wrong. I'm worth, let's say at the time, I'm worth five million bucks, okay? None of them even got 500,000 in a net worth to their name, a house, or nothing. So how, how am I going to use that as fuel anymore? I don't want the race. I can just go back to putting regular fuel in this thing, right? So I had to refuel my brain, okay? So if I'm not mad at these people anymore that they didn't believe me, and I've already proved them wrong, they're not even part of my life anymore, I need some kind of fuel, though. What am I going to do? And that's when I came up with that mission to help as many people as possible become the greatest version of themselves. So now I'm a living example of what's possible. You know, I'm not some dude that caught a lucky break. I'm a guy that's had it, not had it, not had it, not had it, had it, you know, shit. I'll be worth 10 figures for this thing is over with. I'm already, a, I'm not far from that with the software companies and shit that I've built anyway. I mean, our, I've got ownership that I'm the CEO of six companies. Two of those do eight figures per year and the rest of them do multiple seven per year. Like I all by myself, no investors, no partners. This is shit that I run, right? That I did from scratch with no help, no affiliates promoting me, no celebrity endorsements. I just did this shit with a hundred percent hustle muscle. And I love how you think. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just love how you think. Can't nobody I, tell me I, what to do. I love it. But it never ends. You guys, let me tell you a real time story. My guys right here, they'll, they'll, they know. Like, so a month ago, and I don't know what happened. I'm not accusing anybody of anything, right? But uh, just like you guys saw that Chase kicked Kanye out, right? A month ago, Bank of America kicked me out. 
They sent me papers out of nowhere saying, I have millions of dollars, not as many as Kanye, but I got a lot of fucking money. And they send me notices saying, all your accounts, all your credit cards canceled the fuck out of our bank 30 days. I've been, I've been with them for 22 years. Millions of dollars. Never NSF fee. I have a 780 credit score. I carry a lot of shit on my credit, so it's never been in the 800s. But I have a 780 credit score. Never missed a payment. Even when I was in prison on anything in my entire life, always kept my word. I told you I refunded people 25 fucking dollar books and bankrupted my family, basically. Like, that's how I roll. And they send me letters. Nobody will help me. No nothing. Just kick me the fuck out. I don't know what I did. Well, I, I'm already at another bank. But this is the this is the the the, the trials never end. So this is right now today. Three weeks ago, they sent me these letters. We make the arrangements. We got the other bank. We went to a smaller bank, right? I'm sure and they I were thrilled, though. <laughs> yes, you're moving millions of dollars. Yep. I went to the bank that gave me the loan on the building that I just bought. And uh, they were in my office yesterday setting all of our stuff up. Completely different experience than 22 years not having one contact at Bank of America, right? No matter how wealthy I got and, or how many assets they had under management over there. They lost all that shit, moved it all to this other bank. And I've got until Monday was the final day, like this coming Monday, the final day to get all my shit out of there, right? Like the 19th, I think it is. So yesterday, we go to pull payroll out. Payroll's tomorrow. We pay every two weeks on Friday. Payroll's tomorrow. Bank of America's frozen. The whole fucking counts. <laughs> I got a million dollars sitting in the account for payroll and it, for all my companies, and they're like, oh, no, no, that account's froze. So we called them yesterday. Hey, fuck, man. Like, there's <laughs> families at risk here. They're, it's like... You're messing on people's like, lives. And I can't just go take... Like, we already got it set up into the other bank, but all this happened so fast. We got a job going, too. You know what I mean? Like, we've been on the road. You guys know what we do for a living here. Everybody's yeah. stressed. So I have to send a, a, a message to everybody on my staff. It's six fucking different companies, a hundred and something fucking employees yesterday saying, we ain't broke, but I got your money. If you have a bill that needs to be paid on Friday for whatever reason, hit me up. I'll give you cash on my own fucking personal account. And so did three or four of my top sales guys. You need money? Come hit us up. Thank God. Right. But I had to send a letter to everybody letting them know, that, hey, man, we don't have payroll this week. It's not for lack of a money. It's just we'll get you paid by Tuesday or Wednesday. So it's it's constantly fucking something. But who knows when I leave with you guys here in a few minutes, I'm going over to the bank. They could tell me they put in a 30 day hold on the fucking exit checks. Yeah. Right? Who fucking knows? Yeah. Well, listen, this has been high, intense, you know, <laughs> high energy. We love it. We know that you're on a time crunch, but um, want to want to. Do this. It's time for us to land oh, the plane. Uh, so, so we finished every show by landing the plane. It's brought to you by the good folks at Sagamore Spirit. Thank you to Tim, uh, Kevin Plank, everybody out in Baltimore who's part of this partnership. Uh, Visionaries, you know, we, we only have products that we stand behind on this show. It's a great ride. Uh, gentlemen, everybody in the room, we'll, we'll, we'll invite you to, to, to have a taste here in a hot second. Um, all right. So as we're doing that. Yeah. In the essence of time, right? Yeah. Um, we always ask this question. So we got three questions we want to ask you. So, um, What's the long-term vision for Ryan Stuman? Uh, my long-term vision is to just keep going in the direction that I'm in now, man. You know, I just grow in every day, you know, and, and I want to be the guy that the guys go to. That's my vision. I want to be the guy that the Grant Cardones come to, the next up in generation, even him, the Tony Robbins come to me and they say, hey, man, how did you do this? How can we think like you? How can we be more? How can we use the stuff that you've learned to impact more people on our end? I I'm working my way to be that guy. You're leading that's leaders. That's what I want to do because I can make a bigger impact leading leaders than trying to lead the masses. Okay. All right. Um, it's you at a round table. There's five other seats. You get to have anybody you want. The only stipulation is that you can't have God at your table because who wouldn't want to talk to him? Outside of that, who you want your table? Uh, uh, her, Mariana, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife, Drewby Wilson, that's three. Uh, Bobby Castro and, and Keith Kraft. Okay. So all people I know, people that would sit at my table anyway. I'd be taking a chance on outsiders, you know? <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, we want to say thank you. Uh, we're truly humbled to bring the lab into the Apex headquarters, chop it up with you. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to go ahead and give your social media handles for anyone that's been under a rock and doesn't know how to find you. So first of all, Let's just go on and get this. I will never send you a DM ever. Like, I'm never, <laughs> I'll never ask you for money. I'll never tell you to buy my shit. Now, if you send me a DM, I might reply with one of those things, but I will never be the person to slide in your shit. There's a, I, I, my accounts all, every account on every channel has a blue check mark next to it. YouTube, 
Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, they're all verified. So if it's not an account with a blue check mark next to it, I did not slide in your DMs. The reason why I say that is when you're big like me, this is like one of the side effects is like people copy my profile with a name similar to mine and try to convince you that they're me or they're on my team. And that's just not how we roll. If somebody's on my team, you'll know, you'll just know. Uh, they won't be me on my team. <laughs> so, uh, But Instagram, it's at Hardcore Closer. Uh, again, the only one with the blue check on Facebook, it's real Ryan Stuman. Again, blue check there. YouTube, it's Ryan Stuman official. Uh, those are the three places that that I'm really at. Uh, you can send me a DM on Instagram or Facebook. I'm pretty active on there. That's actually me. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to join a really cool community on Facebook, we have one of the largest groups uh, for salespeople. We have the largest sales group on Facebook. 110,000 people. It's called Sales Talk with Sales Pros. It's free for everybody to join. Just make sure you read the rules. Don't do nothing dumb because they will roast your ass in there. Mm, love it, love it, love it. So um, as we land the plane, we, we have a magical time machine, okay? What advice would Ryan Stuman be giving himself from five years ago? So you're five years younger. What advice, as you're talking back to yourself, what advice are you giving yourself? Uh. Five years ago, I would go and tell myself, I went back in time, I would say, hey, listen, you think you're a sales guy. You think that this shit is all about marketing and sales and business, but the truth is it's about personal development and mindset. And the more you lean into being the leader that you are, the, the more powerful you'll become in the long run. You see, for, for me, I never saw myself as a leader. Now, mind you, I told you guys I sold drugs to older people, right? There has to be some leadership quality there, right? <laughs> I, I, I went to prison. I was putting on seminars for gang members and shit on how to clean up their money. Like, I'm this natural-born leader, but I never thought of that. I never thought of myself that way. So I spent my whole life thinking I'm some follower that was weak that nobody really, and I'm trying to push, pull, I'm trying to prove myself even more because of that, right? But about three years ago, Pastor Keith Craft, he's, he and I are talking, he says, uh, I said that. I was like, well, I feel like, you know, like more like Moses than Jesus, meaning Moses was a situational leader. He was thrown into that shit, whereas Jesus was a leader from birth, right? I said, I'm more like Moses than Jesus. I'm just being thrown into leading this movement. He goes, man, are you kidding me? He's like, goes off on me. You know, you've been this, that, and the other. It's like, but until sometimes the right person tells you something, you never really thought about it. And so now I look back and think all this time that I wasn't focused on being a good leader. I was just trying to be a good salesman. That if I went back and could tweak it to where sales are sales, but being a better leader, it, I would be light years ahead. Even just five years back, I would be light years ahead of where I am now just with that two-year gap bridged. Love it. We're going to fast forward the clock. I'm going to make you a little bit older. Okay? You're five years older. What version of Ryan Stuman five years from now, what advice is he giving you today? Uh, good question. So five years from now, I plan on exiting my software company. So that would be probably, and, and by that time, my new house will be built too that we just bought the stuff for. So um, probably five years from now, uh, that guy is saying, hey, man, just don't quit what you're doing. You, it worked. <laughs> you know, I really do. I, I, uh, I think I have that. I'm that 10, 15-year plan anyway. A friend of mine named Ed Milet once told me. Love Ed Milet. Ed, we had you almost on the show before. We want you on the show. Let's make it happen. Ed's good people. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes. Ed told me back in 2017 when we were on the phone together. I told you guys I have really good memory. Uh, he said, well, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm about to be 40. And he said, oh, shit, you ain't even made money yet. He's like, your 40s when you make money, your 50s is when you compound it, and then your 60s is when you do whatever the hell you want to do. He said, I'm at the time, he's like, I'm 49. I just exited my company for a half a billion dollars. Now I'm going to spend the next decade compounding that. And so it, at that time, me being 39, Ed's 10 years older than I am, it, me at that time being 39, I thought, man, this guy in the 22nd, I, knew, I didn't know who Ed was by the time. That was, that by, that, by the way, that was the first time we'd ever met, and somebody made us get on the phone together because he needed a favor because he was about to start an Instagram channel. Like, that's how long ago this <laughs> was, right? Time flies by, but that's how this conversation happened. And Ed says, um, he says, yeah, you, you, your 40s when you earn money, your 50s when you compound. It's like this dude in a, in a quick conversation that needed a favor from me just gave me the game plan because it changed how to, hey, I got to get my money in my 40s. Because so many people, they spend money in their 40s. They finally buy their dream home. They finally buy that Mercedes Benz. They finally, you know, take a loan out against their 401k. So by the time they're 50, they ain't got nothing to compound. So 
I've been on that path since 2017, having that conversation with Ed to where I exit phone sites, just like he exited from uh, um, uh, Transamerica or whatever the company, that, or WFG. Yep. So the way, I'm following that same process, my mentor right now is a guy named Bobby Castro. He made a $1.8 billion exit cash himself. And so I've got him in my corner walking me through how to do this. So like he gave me the blueprint and I'm on it. So I say that because five years from now, Ryan's just probably going to come back and be like, high five. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I love it. I love it. Stu, appreciate you being on the show. Absolutely, fellas. This has been amazing. The three Ryan's. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Never last time here in this, in this studio That's it. and yeah, never again, one. probably. Yeah. I'm Ryan assuming. cubed in the house. Yeah. You know, Visionaries, I hope you got a lot of value out of this. M remember to like, s subscribe, and share on all of our platforms. Um, remember, each one of our guests that are dropping into the lab are dropping nuggets of wisdom. Ultimately, my friends, it's up to you to pick them up. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ryan Mosley. He is Ryan Cuffey. Thank you to our guest, Ryan Steumann. Thanks to the, the guys behind the cameras here at Apex. And uh, we'll see you all next week another great episode of the Vision Lab Podcast. Blessings.